Kyle, looking at, of course, Paul George, the biggest, biggest acquisition we really think as we talk about the entire offseason was Paul George. We are now less than a week away from the start of media day and training camp, and we need to talk about some of those players that could be just as impactful for their specific teams and challenging Boston and Philadelphia in the Eastern Conference. Yeah, and so I think the point of separation between the Sixers and signing Paul George and, for example, the Knicks getting Mikael Bridges are that because the Sixers set this up as the cap space offseason, they have made more of these impactful additions, right? Like they got Paul George and they got Caleb Martin and they got Andre Drummond. And it's it's more of like you're filling out the roster with these big additions rather than just you get the headliner. Mm-hmm. And so I think if you were to – we put together a list before the show – I think really, if you're just talking about singular edition, the only guy in the East who's comparable is Mikhail, right? Like it's mm-hmm. it's him versus Paul. Now you want to say Mikhail's younger. He goes to a team that went was that beat the Sixers outright and went further than them last season. That has that you know one A guy in Brunson that people believe in. Certainly, you can make a case that the Knicks had the best edition of the off season in the East. I think that's offset. Not all the way, certainly, but at least somewhat by the fact that Hartenstein left, goes to OKC. And on top of that, the recent news that we talked about on the show this week that Mitchell Robinson will miss time. So they're going to have to figure some things out there. Is Julius Randle going to play the five? How how much do you lean on McHale as a secondary creator versus using him as that you know dynamic off ball, whether it's a, as a shooter, as a cutter, connective passer? You know, what does his role look like in that offense? I, I think the reason I still keep the Sixers at the top of just like the offseason list is because there's less to figure out, presumably. It is just like plug and play, right? Like you drop Paul George into a team. And Mikhail is certainly in that, you know, category of player, right? I think Mikhail Bridges could play on any team in the league and find success. It's really just a matter of, kind of figuring out what it looks like when it's not just the Jalen Brunson show all the time, which is kind of how it operated there last year. Uh, Certainly, if you're talking about long-term, like, yeah, Bridges is more of a long-term piece, a long-term fixture, because he is only 27, 27, somewhere around there. Yeah, he just turned a birthday in August. Okay. Um, But I think the Sixers probably got the piece they needed more. They have fewer question marks right now. To Kyle's point, I do think Paul George... If there's anyone in the league who's more of a you know drag and drop, put anywhere third option than Mikhail, it would be Paul George. So I think there's it just makes a little bit of you know it's a little bit cleaner, and there's not as much of a question mark, especially now that we know that Mitchell Robinson is going to be out so long. You don't necessarily want to say like factor injury into this, but yeah, I think the Sixers probably won the offseason in the Eastern Conference. So Kale clearly is that the only one that really stands up when it comes to the Paul George acquisition and how much it's going to help. But now you just, we've been saying it from the very beginning, that Hartenstein piece, that's a really, really big loss, as deep as that team is. And now Mitchell Robinson is out and you're going to rely on, what, Jericho Sims and and Precious Precious. Achua? And Randall. And again, maybe he can do that. And maybe maybe you get offensive benefits from that, right? Because Randall's expanded his range. He's more of a three-point shooter than he used to be. And I'm not saying that I I certainly don't trust him unequivocally as a shooter, but bringing a lot more there than than Hartenstein or or Mitchell Robinson, certainly. It's just how does that look and do the two wing guys do enough around the center that, you know, Julius Randle's not going to be caught into action as like a true rim protector, right? It's a they don't have to worry about the rebounding as much because of their team size on the wing as the Sixers do. And Randall is a good defensive rebounder himself, but they have real rim protection issues yeah. if they have to play him like that. So they have to be ultra solid on the perimeter to get away with that. I do think, though, to your point about you know bringing in Ananobi, their record last year once they got him was like lights yep. out good. They were one of the best teams in the league. Might have been had the best record in the league from the point that he started playing for them onward. And while, granted, they had Hartenstein for that stretch, yes. Randall was out for it. And Randall is the big sort of lingering question mark for the Knicks. You know, how does he integrate with this 
group. I think he did a really good job last year as Brunson became the very clear number one guy. And, you know, Randall had been a recent all-star. And, you know, he's a guy who's high draft pick, high expectations everywhere he's been. And so he's gotten to a point in his career where he's willing to and able to take an effective step back. But now that you have Mikhail, now that you have another guy who demands touches to some extent, where does that leave him? I mean, Brunson was getting, he's scoring like 29 points a game. He's a top five MVP finisher last year. You add McHale, who was the man in Brooklyn, has been part of high-level winning teams. Where does that leave Randall? Where does that leave even Ananobi? Like one of our concerns sure. when they yeah. traded for him, or I would say when we were talking about the Sixers trading for Ananobi was, will he get the amount of touches that he has seemed to want in the past? Like, is that going to become a problem? So how they sort things out in New York, I'm very, very fascinated by, especially because Tibbs is not, he's, he's an um, amazing defensive coach, yes, right? Like the is. things his teams do well, they do extremely well, but he's not been renowned for, you know, having like the best, like free flowing offense basically ever. So that's one of his big questions this year is how do you sort all that out? Yeah. No, I mean, there's a lot of variability. Like I think the Knicks currently have, a higher over under win total than the Sixers. But it seems like there's a lot in flux there for a mm-hmm. team that's really good and has a lot of really good pieces. And one, I think when they had like all of their starters after the OG trade, they were like 24 and two or something absurd like that. Mm-hmm. It was really incredible for a team that had that level of success between the, the depth at center, the injuries at center, you know, trying to figure out everything, getting Julius Randall, um, injury concerns with OG. There's just a lot of question marks on that team. And I say that, and I full well know that I cover the Sixers, who seem like they invent question marks mid-season. Uh, and certainly the That's health question mark. That's why you're able mark. to recognize them so well <laughs> yes. from others. Um, but they do seem like for a team that most people expect will either be a two or three seed in the Eastern Conference, they have a lot of question marks. Here's my other thing with the Randall. Let's say he is playing the five sometimes, right? And he does that. Ananobi can play up a little bit and play yes. five depending on who that is. But the one thing that we cannot discount from both Hartenstein and Mitchell Robinson, Kyle, when you brought up the rebounding, let's go back to the other side with the offensive rebounding because mm-hmm. that is not Julius Randall's forte. It's just not. He is not the one that's busting it. Neither he or Brunson to do that. Mikhail Ananobi and Josh Hart, they are certainly the ones to do that if they're in the lineup. But if he's at the five and and doing and Julius Randle is doing a spot at the five and he's boxing out and he's making sure that nobody else gets it. All right, cool. He's doing a spot and boxing out. But they were very, very fortunate because of what they were able to do on the offensive glass from both Robinson and Hartenstein <laughs> when they were both healthy. And I just don't know that that is something that Randall was interested in with those 50-50 balls and trying to get out there and get those extra possessions as, as those guys would, knowing that they are certified role players and that's what they do to stay on the floor. That's just not Randall's forte. Well, and even if you were to say, you know, Randall's effort will be there and he's going to commit on that end of the floor in terms of rebounding, and maybe he does, maybe he doesn't. I think the thing with Hartenstein and Robinson is they're such big bodies that Mm -hmm. even when they're not getting rebounds, you can't lose them, right? Or somebody's got to, if it's Joel, if it's someone like Yabuselli, you got to hit them with a, a box out, with a clear out to try to open up that space for other guys to get rebounds. And we saw that a ton during that series in round one where Joel got into pretty good position. Joel was able to hit somebody like Hartenstein. And then Josh Hart comes flying in out of nowhere. And that's, it's a credit to the guys on the team. It's a credit to, you know, Tibbs kind of instilling that uh, mentality into these guys. But that is a potential loss for this group is I think they can get away with on the defensive end because of Ananobi, because mm-hmm. of Mikhail, some of these other guys. You can guard up positions and double and do different things, and they have enough good to great defenders on that team to not really miss the you know the size and the rim protection. But I do wonder how much it's going to eat into their ability to be not just a good rebounding team, no. but like that it, that defined their team how good they were and how aggressive they were there. How that changes it, it's unclear. I still, all I feel like all I've done is like skepticism, skepticism, skepticism. They're going to be really good. Yes, and they're they a are. team that, yes, they whether are. it's Boston, whether it's the Sixers, you have to keep your eye on them at all times because the one thing with Tibbs, 
for all whatever his flaws are and running guys into the ground and you know really riding his top guys he gets the most out of his teams and those guys run through a wall for him and we saw the results of that last year they can stay healthy they are going to be a massive problem for everybody we all silly like the mayor 